Let's stand together and let's turn on our Bibles to um, the book of Ezekiel chapter 38. This would be always good to have a Bible uh, in church, whatever form, print or electronic. But um, guys, just slow up a little bit. Uh, today, you will be completely lost without a Bible. So if you don't have one, just flag these guys and they'll get one. And if they run out, they'll come back and get another one for you. And, uh, and if you don't own a Bible, make that Bible a gift from the Lord to you today. A reminder as well, on Sunday nights, we go through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, currently studying in the book of Acts, where we'll be tonight at 6 o'clock, and each of you are invited. Ezekiel chapter 38 this morning, in a, a prophecy update, is a kind of break from our regular series. And I want to read the first 14 verses uh, from that chapter. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around and put hooks into your jaws and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, and uh, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Cush and Libya are with them, all, with, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all of his troops, the house of Togarma from the far north and all its troops, many people with, are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all of your companies that are gathered around you, and be a guard for them. And after many days you will be visited, and the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They, are now, uh, they were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. And thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take the plunder and the booty and to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, and to make a great plunder? We'll stop there and we'll pray. Father, thank you for your word and the broad variety in which it takes and, and all of the different subjects that you address related to our lives, all of the things that we need to know that you want to dominate our hearts, our minds, our soul, and our strength. And we thank you ahead of time for every intent of your heart and your mind for this passage, so this passage we'll look at here today. And we ask for the work of your Holy Spirit that that intent will be accomplished in each one of our lives. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. This morning I want to jump from our series for one week and do a prophecy update. I, so often I think that the last one I've done was just a year or two ago and then I'll look at the calendar on it and, and then like now I realize it's been seven years or something like that and so many people, not much of an update, huh? <laughs> staying current. And I realize so many people don't, uh, you know, understand things that we need to understand in this regard. I assume that each of us have uh, followed in the news the atrocities that have occurred in the land of Israel associated with October 7th when the civilian population in, the, in, in Israel was attacked by Hamas and, uh, and representatives of Hamas 
and uh, going in and slaughtering so many people and, and, uh, and worse, doing things worse than death. When Hamas, also known as the Islamic Resistance Movement, uh, and elected the governing authority of the Palestinian people since 2007, instigated this uh, attack, and Hamas having been designated as a uh, a terrorist group by the United States State Department as far back as 1997, and, and this group launched this attack against uh, the Jewish people. After which, uh, uh, Israel then launched a military operation into Gaza with the announced intent, and I quote their prime minister, uh, to eliminate Hamas by destroying its military and governing capac uh, capabilities and to do everything possible to bring our hostages home. Uh, Israel has recently announced that their uh, offensive into uh, Gaza uh, and required in order to accomplish these things that it's not even uh, remotely finished and will take several more months to accomplish their goals. And so at this moment uh, in the world and in the Middle East, there's a real concern that this is going to uh, all expand into a war that involves much of the Middle East. On the day after Christmas, Israel's defense minister, uh, Yoav Gallant, uh, declared that Israel is being attacked in seven separate theaters am uh, amid the ongoing war in the Gaza Strip, that the military of Israel has stepped up to address uh, six of them. He named the arenas that uh, they are being attacked from as Gaza, Lebanon, Syria, the West Bank, Iraq, Yemen, and Iran. And so at this point, after about three months, uh, the war uh, there it, surrounding Israel is expanding. It's not contracting. Uh, while the Jews recognize that this is a fight for their very lives, and for their very existence, and while her enemies have made no secret of their uh, intention to drive the Jewish people uh, out of the land of Israel. And so this morning I want to spend our time considering the prophet Ezekiel and his prophecy in chapters 38 and 39 to know what God says will be the condition, the geopolitical condition of the world in what the Bible calls the last days or the end of this current age. If you're with us here today and all of this is brand new to you, um, don't be overwhelmed by it. Uh, I think you'll be able to understand most of it, but um, uh, it, it's, uh, it will be, will be f very academic in, in some respect. But to be ac academic and to actu and actually study something is not to be unspiritual at all. And so pick up what you can, and, uh, and I think you'll be able to pick up what's most important. It is important to realize that uh, the Bible talks about the fact that there is an end times in human history, and that history, human history, even presently, is not out of control, that is never out of control, that is never unfolding uh, randomly, uh, driven solely by uh, us uh, that inhabit this world, but to realize that God is sovereignly overseeing all of this, and he's working uh, world history to his God-appointed uh, end. The Lord is not going to allow the rebellion of man, of man against him to go on indefinitely. There will be a time when he will rise up and he will put an end to it. He did create the heavens and the earth. The earth belongs to him. We're renting here. And uh, we lose sight of the fact that this has been entrusted to us as a stewardship and not as a base for rebellion against God in the universe. And so there comes a point in time where God is going to bring all of that to an end and bring human history to his wonderful uh, conclusion. What the Bible refers to as the last days or end times, it refers to the days on the earth that will immediately precede Jesus' return for the church and what is called the rapture of the church also the seven-year tribulation period that follows that 
rapture of the church, that seven-year tribulation comes to an end at Jesus' second coming, and then as Jesus comes at His second coming, He establishes His millennial or His thousand-year reign on the earth. I want you to notice in chapter 38 that these events that are recorded here are twice referred to as having to do with the last days, verse 8 and in verse 16. The last days in the old King James, uh, the latter years or days in the new King James. And so it provides us with the revelation as to what will be the geopolitical situation surrounding Israel in what God calls the last days and what we can expect to see in place in those last days. And so this prophecy that is given in chapters 38 and 39, uh, they await a future fulfillment. There's nothing like them in the history uh, of the nation of, of Israel. Nothing matches what is here. In Jesus' parable of the ten virgins, he declared that concerning the time of his return, Uh, to rapture the church prior to the seven-year tribulation period that's to come upon the earth. He said, watch therefore, for you you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So any attempt to to pinpoint to a day or an hour Jesus' return for the church and what's called the rapture is unbiblical, and yet people continue to do this and sometimes make a fortune off of it. We do not and cannot know the day or the hour. But the Bible teaches uh, just as clearly that uh, we should be able to recognize the fact that it is drawing near. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul wrote, but concerning the times and the seasons, uh, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. So we should recognize the times and the seasons of the condition of the world, as the Bible explains it, prior to Jesus' return. And so how can we know that the day is approaching? And God's given us uh, extensive uh, revelation related to this in the Bible in the form of prophecy. And biblical prophecy, God's prophecy, is simply a history in advance. So that when we see this prophetic uh, picture Uh, develop right before our eyes, it'll produce this uh, not being frightened by the condition of the world, but this sense of peace, this sense of confidence to say, I recognize that. God has said that it would be just like that, and Jesus is returning, and to put that hope within our hearts and minds. Watching Bible prophecy being fulfilled before our eyes it's never given to us in order to kind of terrify us, but it's always given to us to remind us that God is in control of human history and that Jesus is returning for us soon. Um, I, sometimes I forget, and, and so I have to remember so there aren't like eight years between talking about these kind of things, that Bible prophecy, I... I Uh, in, for instance, what is in these chapters here, once I know these things as a Christian, then it becomes the grid by which I process the news and world events. And so in much the same way uh, that if you're reading through a mystery novel or something and it takes all of these twists and all of these turns and you don't know what's going to happen and all of that, well, it's one thing to be caught in a mystery In reading a book, it's another thing to try and navigate this life and everything's a mystery. But when you read the end of the book, then you read it with an entirely different perspective. You're at peace, you know how it ends, you know the hero can't die in episode one because his picture is on episode 10. So when you know the end of the story, then it allows the, the, the story to unveil and to be able to enjoy that, so to speak, while it happens. And the same thing is true related to human history. God gives us prophecy so that we can process human history in that same way, in with that same uh, uh, peace. 
and for us to be reminded, always reminded, that everything's under control. And so I want to begin by looking at what the Bible says about the geopolitical condition uh, of the world concerning Israel and uh, the Middle East. The historical context of Ezekiel is important, and Ezekiel wrote this prophecy by the Holy Spirit uh, 2,600 years ago. And uh, it was after Israel had been defeated, the southern kingdom of Judah, by the ba Babylonian Empire. The northern kingdom of Israel had been taken captive by the Assyrians a uh, hundred years earlier. And so here is both north and south now taken into captivity by the Gentile nations and now in captivity in Babylon, what's known as the Babylonian captivity. And at that particular point in time in Jewish history, for all intents and purposes, Israel as a nation ceased to exist. And in the minds and the hearts of the Jewish people, all hope was lost that they would ever have once again the blessing that they once had, and that was their own homeland in the Middle East, the land of Israel, and that they had forfeited it because of their idolatry and because of their sin. No hope of ever becoming a nation again. But Ezekiel in chapters 37, 36 and 37, he prophesies to Israel that they would one day be gathered back into their land, they would become a nation again, and when they did, they would not become a, a nation that is divided in the northern and southern portions, but that they would be one nation, north and south uh, united. They would constitute a single united nation. And then in one of the greatest miracles in human history, 2,600 years after the prophecy was given by Ezekiel, on May 14, 1948, Israel became a nation again in human history and fulfilling God's prophecy through Ezekiel and doing it against all odds. Never before in human history has a group of people, a national identity, have they ever been displaced from their homeland from, for a period of over 2,000 years and maintained their identity to once again return to their homeland. Always in human history, for that kind of a length of time, that population ends up being absorbed by the other peoples of the world, and then we lose uh, sight of them. So it's a profound mi miracle, the existence of the nation of Israel today. In chapters 40, jumping 38 and 39, chapter 40 of the book of Ezekiel, all the way to the end, you have Ezekiel's description of Israel following Jesus' second coming. And during what's known as the thousand year reign of Christ, uh, 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 of Jesus on the earth centered in uh, Jerusalem. And in the chapters in between, chapters 38 and 39, Ezekiel describes a great military attack that will, an invasion that will be launched against Israel which aims at her destruction. And that this battle will occur, this invasion will occur sometime as he follows the chronology of Ezekiel, sometime between the time that Israel became a nation again, Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37, and the beginning of the kingdom age at the end of the tribulation period, chapter 40. It's the period of human history that we have the privilege of living in right now. The geopolitical condition of the Middle East before this attack uh, that is aimed at Israel's destruction is described in the first 13 chapters of, of chapter 38, which we read. And Israel's attackers are listed. The main player in the attack is in verses two through four, where God addresses a man by the name of Gog. It could be a... Um, a proper name or could be a title for whoever this uh, man is in the same way that we refer to someone as a prime minister or, or a president or a czar or pharaoh or something like that. 
He's the leader of a nation which is referred to here by its ancient name, and that is Magog. And it is an ancient name for the land north of the Caucasus Mountains, and the Caucasus Mountains run between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. It refers to a land that sits north of that mountain range in what today is Russia. It's further identified within the text in chapter 38, verse uh, 15, and then in chapter 39, verse 2, as being to the far north of Israel. And the word far, the Hebrew that Ezekiel uses, it, the word far means to the extreme north. And if you pull out an atlas or you pull out a globe and you uh, hit Israel on that globe and you go all the way as far as you can uh, north, the extreme north, uh, all you've got up there um, is Russia. And so uh, it, 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 there's no nation further north of Israel than Russia. Additionally, we're told in verse 4 that at the time of this invasion, this nation, Magog, will be a major military power. Uh, the description of it is that it will be magnificently equipped uh, for war. And so Russia is today and uh, one of the major world powers, militarily speaking. It's also important to note in this regard Russia's very long history of anti-Semitism. Uh, Russia's, Russia's persecution uh, of Jews is uh, very well known in, in history. Her persecution of Jews, not only within her borders, it goes way beyond that. It includes their long history of faithfully arming all of Israel's enemies in the region. All of the enemies of Israel who have sought Israel's destruction since 1948. And then 1967 when that attempt was made, and then a second one in 1973 when Syria, Jordan, and e Egypt invaded Israel with the intent of driving them into the sea. They were largely, if not exclusively, armed by Russia. And to this day, uh, they keep Israel's worst enemies in the Middle East very well armed and deliberately a constant threat to Israel's safety. And they've been on the wrong side of God's blessing that he spoke to uh, Abraham so long ago. And this battle may ultimately be payback for that severe uh, persecution of the Jews, whether personally or by proxy. You remember God spoke to Abraham, Abram and Abraham uh, the same, and said, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. In you, all of the families of the earth shall be uh, blessed. And historically, uh, no one has been able to curse or to persecute the Jews with impunity. Everyone who ever has done that uh, one day discovers that God has been watching that treatment and then brings judgment upon them. And one day Magog is going to discover that God has been watching their treatment of the Jews as well. Now there are some Bible students and uh, scholars who are every bit as uh, serious about rightly dividing the word of truth and understanding prophecy as I am or any of us are. And they look at Magog and they would say, Magog does not refer uh, to uh, Russia, that it does not refer to a nation above the Caucasus Mountains, and, uh, uh, but rather that it refers to a region immediately below those mountains, which would be today, would be modern day eastern, uh, northern uh, Turkey. And so they, they look at it and they say that's where it's located. You can, uh, as you search these things out and wanting to look for not necessarily religious sources because people can have uh, the acts that they want to grind in this issue, but to try to find the most ancient resources that you can related to this, you can find maps that will show Magog located immediately below those Caucasus Mountains, modern-day Turkey, and 
above. And so it's, it's something where people are making the very best guess that they can, and it's kind of tied to uh, one of those two particular uh, areas. And so uh, uh, those that hold that view, they may very well be right and uh, in identifying uh, it, Magog as, uh, as either south uh, or north or south of the uh, uh, Caucasus Mountains. People have a different view related to that, but it does no harm to us as Christians trying to understand the prophecy to at least hold that in our, our back uh, pocket, not to just dismiss it as something that uh, is, is impossible. I think the strength of holding this kind of a view that it refers to Turkey and not to, uh, to Russia is that it would make all of the nations involved in this invasion of Israel, all of them Islamic. Uh, to understand it as Russia, you have a, uh, a, a, a communist uh, nation and uh, not Islamic at all, and then united with all of these other Islamic nations. If you add Turkey, now you're talking about an exclusively an Islamic invasion of, of uh, Israel. But the thing, one of the things that ties, and there are several things that I'll get into as we go through this, one of the things that, uh, uh, reasons for making Magog uh, north of the Caucasus in making, identifying it as Russia is, is that when Gog leads Magog down out of the north as a part of this invasion, uh, his motivation is not religious. His motivation uh, is not ideological. Uh, we're told in verse 12 there that he comes merely to plunder. And he's, and he's distinct among uh, that collection of nations in, uh, in, uh, in, in that way, his motivation there to plunder. Turkey's military power has grown significantly in recent years. It, it is the 11th ranked military power in the world today. It has active and reserve sir, uh, military people in the vicinity of three quarters of a million soldiers. Among other things, the strength of the Russia uh, view, however, is e Ezekiel's repeated description of Magog coming from the far north as a way of identifying uh, this nation of Magog. But in order to be fair to the other view, and we want to be fair where uh, fairness is, is warranted, uh, in verse 6, and I get a little ahead of myself here on this, when he refers to Togarma, which is clearly Turkey, uh, it, it, they are uh, referred to as coming out of the far north uh, as, as well. So just some uh, food for thought related to that as, you, uh, as we watch world events unfold around us uh, going forward. Notice what the Lord will do to him, to Gog in verse 3. Behold, I'm against you, O Gog which means doom for Gog. You can't take on God and, and win. And so the Lord will turn him around, verse 4, put hooks into his jaws and lead him out from his land and he'll be accompanied by a very impressive military force. You notice also uh, Magog's allies in this attack upon Israel in verses 5 and 6. In the first uh, country that is mentioned as Persia, Persia is the ancient name for uh, Iran. You can't read the news at all today. Uh, and it's important to make a distinction between uh, the government of Iran and the people of Iran. In the same way, there can be very much a difference between the government of the United States and the people of the United States. And so here, uh, you can't read the news at all. Uh, and uh, listen to it without hearing about Iran, and specifically concerning its endeavor to develop uh, nuclear weapons, and as well as its very well-deserved reputation as the top uh, state sponsor of ter uh, terrorism uh, in the world. You notice uh, Ezekiel's reference to God putting hooks in Magog's jaws in order to draw uh, Magog down into this battle, that it is the Lord's doing that this uh, happens. In other words, it appears 
that Magog isn't necessarily looking for this fight initially, uh, that, uh, that she enters this uh, with, with some uh, hesitation a, a, a little bit, and uh, she is drawn into this invasion by some event, this invasion of Israel. Russia, of course, has very strong ties with uh, many of the Islamic nations that surround Israel and has been very supportive of them, not only economically, not only militarily, but also internationally in the UN and elsewhere. And again, I'm going to get one step ahead of myself here, but the, the possible scenario that jumps out for uh, the, the most to me in, in, is the, the very deep and indeed the language is used today, the unprecedented economic and military ties between Russia and uh, Iran today. In other words, this hook, the event that could launch all of this into motion uh, might very well be a military strike by Israel against Iran's nuclear facilities uh, currently uh, being used by Iran to develop nuclear weapons and something Israel has committed to doing, given the danger that a nuclear-capable Iran uh, represents to the Jewish people, uh, especially given their uh, uh, continual call for the destruction of the state of uh, Israel. And so Russia might then come to is uh, Iran's defense and then uh, doing so, use it as a pretext to invade uh, Israel with the allies, which we'll get to in, in just uh, a, a, a moment. Israel has been talking for uh, months and months and months and even years about, and publicly, because they intend to do it, uh, that they will not allow Iran to develop nuclear weapons. They will do whatever they have to do to keep that from happening. Uh, because of Iran's determination to wipe out uh, the, the uh, Jewish state. And so prior to this October 7th, I would get up uh, each day and with the idea that I wouldn't be surprised if in the middle of the night I turn on my news source online and find out that Israel had launched an aerial attack of, in an attempt to destroy those facilities um, in Israel, I mean in Iran, and then, then launching this entire scenario where Russia would then come down in defense of, of their alliance with Iran, and then all of this would be off and uh, often and running. Now, the October 7th events has uh, certainly moved Israel's focus, it would appear, uh, to stabilizing uh, I I its defenses uh, in the wiping out of Hamas and its defense against Hezbollah in the north up in, up in Lebanon. And, uh, and so maybe even the attack on October 7th was intended to buy time for the development of nuclear weapons there in, uh, in Iran. But uh, it is on the table. The Jewish people have made it very, very clear. Their leadership has made it clear. We are not going to pass a nuclear Iran is a problem on to our children and our grandchildren. We cannot live with that. And so something like that uh, would readily spark something that is like is described here. It's also possible that the current war in Gaza that's going on uh, will escalate to require uh, Israel to move up into the north, up into Lebanon, to deal with Hezbollah, another terrorist organization that is also like Hamas, a proxy. Uh, Iran is fighting a proxy war through these terrorist organizations uh, against Israel. And, uh, and then lead them ultimately to a direct confrontation with, uh, Israel, uh, with Iran itself. Six days ago, Israel killed a top Iranian Revolutionary Guard uh, advisor in Syria as a part of uh, this proxy war of Iran against Israel, after which Iran threatened uh, the usurper and savage Zionist regime will pay for this crime and after which, um, uh, uh, two days ago, uh, Saudi uh, media reported that Israel 
killed 11 such leaders of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, very high uh, members of their military in an airstrike at Damascus International Airport. And so this is, uh, everybody knows who's behind everything and things are, are intense and escalating presently there in the Middle East. In terms of these allies that will join Magog, Cush is referenced in uh, uh, verse 5, and it refers to the modern-day nation of Sudan. Um, you, you might remember in 2011 that the nation of Sudan, rather, it divided into two. Um, because the northern part was exclusively 97% Islam, very, very hostile towards uh, the an uh, animistic and then also uh, the Christian uh, Sudanese to the south in that country, so they divided it. So there's a northern section that is uh, Sudan, and then the southern is called South Sudan. And in terms of looking at the, the location of, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, Kush, uh, in the ancient world, it sits right on top of what is uh, the northern section, uh, Sudan itself today. Put refers to modern-day Libya, chapter 5. Uh, Libya has stabilized somewhat related to uh, the civil war that followed uh, the death of uh, Muammar Gaddafi, uh, with Iran now taking the lead uh, now within Libya to turn it around economically, uh, militarily, to help rebuild the nation. Iran, of course, is always looking to increase its influence within the region. And, uh, and uh, so they're enlarging that reach now into North Africa, into Libya. And of course, Libya's loyalty to them uh, it, it will certainly be a condition of their assistance. Russia began to help Libya following uh, that uh, revolution there within and, and unraveling of Libya uh, long before Iran did and trying to get kind of an outpost on North Africa politically, economically, militarily with the same goals as uh, Iran in, in mind. In verse 6, uh, Gomer and Togarma, uh, those are the ancient names for modern-day Turkey, modern-day uh, central and western Turkey. And uh, those are uh, unanimously agreed upon is, is the, uh, ancient, the location of those, those ancient, uh, 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 ancient uh, kingdoms. Turkey, of course, is a Muslim nation. It has a secular government, uh, which in recent years under their current president, President Erdogan, uh, has dramatically strengthened its ties with Russia, also with Iran, and has become openly hostile uh, toward the nation of Israel. Uh, within the last few days, uh, uh, Erdogan himself declared the Jewish prime minister uh, of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, to be worse than Hitler. Um, I... You, you can't say anything to a Jew or to a Jewish leader than to poke them in the eye with that. I mean, it's impossible to even describe the offense that such a statement uh, uh, would, would make. And so, warning, as Erdogan has done, that Israel would pay a very high price um, if it attempted to eliminate Hamas uh, terrorists in Turkey. But for many years now, Erdogan has engaged in a lot of saber rattling with Israel. And it is strengthening, Turkey is strengthening its ties uh, to Iran, in particular the Islamic world as a whole. And even at the risk, even alienating Europe, uh, even undermining its attempts to become a part of, uh, of NATO. And, and despite uh, the damage that could be done to that goal of, of uh, Turkey, uh, Erdogan is aligning with the Islamic world in a dramatic way. All of it in line with Ezekiel's prophecy, uh, Turkey 
has made that uh, turn away from Europe and toward the Islamic world. Each of Russia's or Magog's allies listed here are united by the religion of Islam, uh, united in their open hostility toward, uh, toward Israel, and one day they will happily unite together in an attempt to uh, uh, the destruction of the nation of Israel. Remember that Ezekiel prophesied this again uh, almost 2,000 years before uh, the birth of uh, Islam into uh, human history. In other words, he writes this, and anybody reading this in the ancient world would wonder, how could all of these countries with all of their agendas contrary to one another. What in the world could unite such a diverse group of people into an invasion desiring the destruction of the nation of Israel? And not knowing that Islam would be come into the world in existence in, in uh, the seventh century and become uh, the uniting uh, factor related to uh, to all of this. Now, in favor of Magog, uh, it, it, in terms of it uh, being Russia as opposed to Turkey, is the fact that Magog, uh, is, as, he, as it is described here in the passage, it is described with a very distinct identity from Gomer and Togarma, which are clearly Turkey. So, Here you have a nation coming out of the north, and it has its own identity as as Magog in terms of the ancient title, and it is something different from Gomer and Togarma, which is Turkey. And so it does appear uh, that uh, uh, is a reason for, uh, you know, leaning in that direction related to this. But Whichever one happens, I'm, you know, uh, it, it, it won't trouble me at all in terms of the fulfillment of, of prophecy. Almost as interesting in uh, Ezekiel's prophecy are the nations that are uh, conspicuously absent from being listed as joining this invasion uh, of, of Israel. Nations that you would think would immediately join, but they don't in verse 13. Sheba and Dedan refers to uh, modern-day Saudi Arabia. They will not enter in to this, uh, this particular invasion. Uh, they will not like this development, and that would be their reaction today because even though they're Muslim, uh, they fear the further empowerment of Iran in the region. And so they view it as a threat to themselves. The merchants of Tarshish, which are referred to, uh, are uh, 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 descendants of Javan, which is part of a genealogy in Genesis chapter 10, who settled in Greece, and perhaps it's a reference to Europe. And so the protest of the merchants of Tarshish will be verbal. It will not be military. They will not come to Israel's uh, aid. Uh, There is no mention of Egypt, even though Egypt is a historic enemy uh, of uh, uh, of Israel. But currently there's a peace treaty between them. Uh, There is no mention of Jordan. Jordan currently has and honors, as Israel does, a peace treaty between those two nations. Then... There is no mention of Syria, and uh, they won't get involved in the attack. And of course, uh, they are in the middle of, uh, hopefully not in the middle of, maybe at the end of it or whatever, but they've got their hands full right now as they are entering into the 13th year of a civil war. And uh, so they're in no position to uh, engage in something like this if it were to happen today. And then there's no mention of Iraq. And even though there's great cooperation between uh, Iran and Iraq on many, many fronts, there's also a deep distrust of uh, Iran in Iraq by uh, much of the population and the meddling of Iran into uh, the Iraqi state and nation and its own Uh, business, and uh, and you add that in addition to the fact that Iraq is still recovering 
uh, from the Iraqi war back in 2003 to 2011, which our nation was involved in. She then went through her own uh, civil war from uh, 2012 to 2018. You remember, you might remember that 40% of the land in Iraq at that time was under the control of ISIS. And it took considerable effort to regain control of their own uh, nation. And so Iraq is currently uh, licking her wounds, so to speak, and uh, seeking to move forward from a, a very much a, a war-torn recent past and uh, could hardly be eager to enter into another conflict uh, presently. And as you look at, at this prophecy, it's an exact description of the geopolitical world we live in today. And this alignment, this geopolitical alignment, has never occurred before in, in human uh, history. The battle itself is described that will occur in this invasion, uh, beginning in verse 7 of chapter 38. Uh, they will attack uh, uh, Israel like a storm. They will come uh, with overwhelming force, verses 7 through 9. Uh, their evil plan in verses 10 to 12 is a surprise attack upon a, uh, a peaceful uh, nation of Israel. It will look like a piece of cake to them. This will not be hard to do. It doesn't appear that Israel will do anything uh, here on this to uh, provoke uh, Magog uh, I- itself and, uh, and this evil plan that comes into the heart of uh, Russia or Magog. Their intent, verse 12, will be to take plunder and booty uh, as well as to destroy the nation and its uh, inhabitants. And what God then does in response is this makes him upset. And so it infuriates him, verse 14, therefore son of man prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel shall dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a company, a great company, and the mighty army. And you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land, and it will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know in their destruction, may know uh, me that I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? And I, it will come to pass At the same time, when God comes against the land of Israel, says uh, the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. This will really upset God. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken. And then God describes how he will then engage in that battle in order to defeat this this invading army. Surely in that day there shall be uh, a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea and the birds of the air of the heavens and the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and, and uh, every wall shall fall to the ground. Now that's an earthquake. And if you've ever been through an earthquake of a much less degree to this, that is a disorienting experience. Uh, Our homes would probably not hold up against, uh, there's no insurance for an earthquake like this. So here they begin this thing, and God supernaturally uh, uh, unsettles them in this way. And then second, he said, I'll call for a sword against Gog throughout my mountains, says the Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. So here you have this confederation of nations. They're heading into battle. But this earthquake, this supernatural uh, setback that happens here and the alarm that they, uh, they have, whatever is, the, whatever is holding this confederation together uh, in their desire to destroy 
uh, the nation of Israel, it will begin to fall apart. In the face of this, it will be every nation for themselves, and they will begin to fight uh, one against the other. And I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him and his troops and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. And so God will come in uh, with all of these things uh, against that invading force in order to bring their defeat. And thus, God says, I will magnify, magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Uh, then they shall know that I am the Lord." People will be watching their television news. The whole world will be glued to this event, as you might imagine. And then when everybody is, is hiding their eyes, expecting there is no way Israel can survive this attack, they're doomed, they're destroyed. Uh, and then when the whole thing turns, there'll be a recognition that a miracle occurred, a miracle that only God could do. On, on their behalf. And for chapter 39, and you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, uh, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I will turn you around, and I will lead you on, bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will knock the bow out of your left hand, cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. And so here you have interesting uh, Old Testament imagery to describe. You, you have people who, some people who believe that in terms of the weaponry that's described, Ezekiel can only describe uh, uh, modern day weaponry in terms of a prophecy in the light of the weaponry that he understood. And that was ancient weaponry, bows, arrows, this kind of thing, and that it's symbolic of the kind of weapons. How can he know about an RPG? How can he know about drones? How can he know about any of this stuff? So he says it in the language of the day, and God uses that. Uh, 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 to communicate in that way. There are other people, and it's uh, food for thought, uh, they look at it and say, no, in terms of horses and in terms of bows and arrows and all of that kind of thing, it could very well be something like that, where you would have a, 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 an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse, uh, released there in that region, uh, completely disable all technology. And now you're back to 2,000 years ago in terms of how to wage war. I, I side with the first group, uh, but the other is, is uh, worth thinking about when you have absolutely nothing else to think about um, in, uh, in your life. And you shall fall upon the nations of Israel, the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you, I will give you to the birds of, of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall in the open field, for I have spoken, says the Lord. And then I will send fire on Magog and on those who live securely in the coastlands, and then they shall know that I am God. In other words, God says, I'll not only j uh, judge the militaries of these countries, but uh, the nations themselves will not go unscathed for launching these uh, uh, forces against Israel. He judges them as well. And so I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Uh, then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Surely, God says, it is coming and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. So God, uh, here in verse 8, uh, he's talking to any of us that are in the room here today, and we're saying, this could never happen. And God, God realizes there are people that might roll their eyes related to it and all, and so he steps in and he says, this is going to happen. God has a, God has a, it must be interesting to be God. I have no interest in uh, the position at all, and you don't have any interest in me having that position. But when God gives prophecies in the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, people respond a couple of different ways. 
If God gives a prophecy about the future and it seems so unrealistic that it could never happen, like Israel becoming a nation again, then they dismiss it as something that now you spiritualize it and you explain it away. Uh, If he gives a prophecy and we read it and we study it like here this morning and it is fully developed before our eyes in the world before us, then other people say, that's too much of a coincidence. That couldn't be from God. And so God just goes on being God and he says what he says, but there's some dynamic here that he has to inform people this is going to happen. And then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and uh, they will set on fire and burn the weapons that are taken in this battle, both the shields, the bucklers, the bows, the arrows, the javelins, the spears, and they will make fires with them for seven years. And they will not take any wood from the field nor cut down any from the forest. Their energy needs will be met uh, by by virtue of, of the plunder that is taken here. Uh, because they will make fires with the weapons, and they will plunder those who plundered them and pillage those who pillaged them, says the Lord. And it will come to pass in that day that I will give Gog a burial place there in Israel, the valley of those who pass uh, by east of the sea, and it will obstruct uh, travelers because there they will bury Gog and his multitude. Therefore, they shall call it the Valley of uh, Haman Gog. And so, uh, uh, Valley of Haman Gog, the Valley of the Hordes of Gog. The burial place for this, uh, uh, the soldiers that are killed in this military, uh, God's uh, destruction of those militaries, they will be buried on the east side of the Dead Sea, uh, Ezekiel tells us here, in what is uh, modern day uh, Jordan. And it will take, uh, and there will be so many bodies that, Uh, traveling will be obstructed by it in that day. For seven months, verse 12, the house of Israel will be burying them uh, in order to cleanse the land of the defilement of of the dead bodies. Indeed, all the people of the land, that is Israel, will be burying and they will gain renown for it on the day that I am glorified, says the Lord God. They will set apart men regularly employed with the help of a search party to pass through Uh, the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. And uh, at the end of seven months, they'll make a final search. The search party will uh, pass through the land. And when anyone sees a bone that is not an intact body, but a body part, you set a marker by it until the barriers have buried it uh, in the valley of uh, Haman Gog. And the name of the city will be uh, uh, Hamanoah, and uh, thus they shall cleanse the land. And Hamanoah meaning uh, multitude. So there is this, uh, the, the Jewish people will take great pains uh, in, in careful in their uh, removal of the bodies. Now, this could just be a reference, probably is simply a reference to the fact that for a Jew under the law of Moses, to touch a dead body renders them unclean, ceremonially unclean. And, uh, and, and so there would be a special group of people that would then uh, address that. Um, if, you, if you ever watch, uh, unfortunately, the videos of maybe a bus being blown up or something like that in, in Jerusalem and the teams that will come out and they will not leave until they have picked up every single piece of every body. Uh, it's their esteem for life, their esteem of, of uh, respect for the person who has died, but also uh, death is, renders something ceremonially unclean. Some people look at this and they'll say, well, given the great attention, the great care that they give to uh, the removal of these bodies, maybe it indicates that some kind of a nuclear exchange occurs. Uh, as a result of that, and, and it needs this special uh, 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 treatment. And so, sanctified speculation, you can do what you want with it. And as for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to every sort of bird and every beast of the field. And then uh, God calls on all of these birds and animals to come out and feast upon uh, the dead bodies that are here. It's likened to kind of a sacrificial meal, kind of with a twist. 
Usually men ate the remains of an animal sacrifice, and here you have men uh, that are being eaten by animals. But it speaks to the greatness of the slaughter and that what has happened is not an indiscriminate slaughter, but it is a, um, it is a, a work of God and a um, in, a, in an act of his holiness. And I will set, verse 21, my glory against the nations. All of the nations shall see my judgment, which I have executed in my hand, which I have laid on them. And so the nation of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. They will recognize that God has done this. Whatever their atheism, whatever their secularism, they'll realize the only way we made it through this was because of God. And the Gentiles will know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity. That's why I removed them from the land to begin with, not because I was done with them and wouldn't protect them, but because of their own unfaithfulness to me. Therefore, I hid my face from them. I gave them into the hand of their enemies, and they all fell by the sword, speaking of their Babylonian captivity, according to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions, I have dealt with them and hidden my face from them. That's why I moved them out of the land. But when I moved them out of the land at the time of the Babylonian captivity, it didn't mean that land became anyone else's in the mind of God. And therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will bring back the captives of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name. After they have borne their shame and, uh, and all their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me and, uh, and in bringing them back uh, to the land and, uh, and the rebirth of the nation that Ezekiel spoke about a couple chapters early. And so they, I displaced them because of their unfaithfulness and uh, to me and because of their idolatry. And so uh, they have borne all of that shame. When they uh, dwelt safely in terms of this attack, in their own land, and no one made them afraid. God looks at this and he says, the land is theirs. The land has always been theirs. Just because I took them behind the shed to give them a whooping, because they deserve the whooping, and Gentile nations then came into that land historically, it never ceased to be their land, and it never ceased to be my plan to bring them back into that land that belongs to them. This idea of the river to the sea, that you're going to drive the Jews out of Israel, are these people crazy? Fly to Israel on a purely secular level and ask yourself, who in the world could drive these people out of this land now? Their roots are so deep to say nothing of the supernaturalness of God's defense of them in that place. It is a folly to think in the light of a physical reality and in the light of the prophecies that the Jews are ever going to be driven out of their land once they have been, as they have now been reestablished in it as a nation May 14th, 1948. And when I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and I am hallowed in them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land and left none of them captive any longer. And I will not hide my face from them anymore, for I shall have poured out my spirit on uh, the house of Israel, says uh, the Lord uh, God. And so the average Jew today uh, in the world is, uh, is, ne- is either an atheist or they are secular. Uh, they are not terribly serious about uh, God or the God of the Bible at all. But when God rises up and makes such an obvious defense of the nation and everybody realizes only God Almighty Uh, This looks like the Old Testament. Only God Almighty 
could have saved us in all of this as the whole world uh, watches all of it happening and then the battle turns and they're saved, they'll come to realize only God uh, could have done that and then to become interested in God and, uh, and uh, then s- all of that sets things up for the Antichrist's offer to build their temple and a deception that comes with that because only a faith in Christ is the ultimate protection from spiritual deception. And the ultimate end of their earthly uh, history will be their recognition of Jesus as their Messiah uh, at his second coming and then their very blessed participation in uh, the kingdom uh, age. One final moment uh, on this, and I I do mean a moment. People uh, oftentimes wonder, well, where does this happen? It hasn't happened yet, so where does it land? Some people try to identify this battle with Armageddon, which happens at the end of the tribulation period. It, it bears no resemblance to Armageddon at all. We're not talking about the same battle. Some people say, well, maybe it's the battle that occurs at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ and a final rebellion of man ag- against God. It bears no resemblance to that battle. It is its own uh, battle. My inclination is to believe that it will occur sometime immediately before the rapture of the church or after the rapture of the church. We may or may not see this battle as Christians. I don't think as they, uh, it makes sense to me that Israel is going to burn the booty or the oil or the, the, the fuel reserves for seven years. I don't see them doing that into the kingdom age. It would be happening during the tribulation uh, period. And so it seems to me that would be the best place to to put it. And so when something like this one day unfolds, and uh, if we are here to see it, to know uh, things are very, very close. But the knowledge of this, to realize this all just sits for the first time in human history. It has never sat uh, this completely before. Now, we can look at it and say, there's a, there's a couple pieces that can continue to develop. Yes, always related to prophecy. But all of the pieces are in place. The description of Ezekiel here for this battle and the setup for it is what we see the world as geopolitically today, not just in the Middle East, but into Europe and around the world. And so what a remarkable time we live in prophetically and to say nothing of all of the other prophetic signs of Jesus' return uh, in the Scriptures. And so, um, you've been very patient with me uh, this morning. I didn't want to do this in two parts. Can you imagine trying to keep that train of thought uh, together? But all I want is I want every Christian to be able to watch world events as informed as God wants us to be, so that we can then have a biblical response to these things, not be terrified, but to recognize that in all of it, it simply means that our redemption is drawing nigh. To pray for parties involved, to pray for what's happening, all of those things, to be engaged, to be watching and waiting as Christians, but to realize God is marching things towards His wonderful, wonderful end as it relates to human history. Let's stand together and we'll close in prayer. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you don't want to leave us in the dark on all of this. Somehow, you leave us, you leave us in the dark on many things. And apparently it's okay but it's not okay to be in the dark on this one. And so we thank you for the revelation. And we thank you for the part that it's supposed to play in each one of our lives as we serve you and live for you in this world. And we pray that it would accomplish that purpose. And we ask it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.